Blesse mon cœur d'une langueur monotone. Je répète. Blesse mon cœur d'une langueur monotone. Hey everybody, Dutch Sense here. 8.42 p.m. Central Time on Monday, November 11th, 2013. And I've got you over here on my Facebook page, and I've been going through a series of strange events lately, guys. Let's just get right into it. I've been having to issue a response now to the Philippines News Agency, who ran a full story on me and a video that I put out on my YouTube channel, and this is on November 8th, I had put out a video showing a microwave pulse that we traced back to the formation of Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Yolanda. And that's the Philippines typhoon that caused so much damage and so many people have been hurt in this storm. And I'd put this video out on the 8th, tracing it back. Now that was as the storm was hitting and we didn't know how much damage was uh, currently taking place in, in the area, but it's just significant amount of damage has happened. Now, on the morning news in the Philippines, they issued a response debunking me, quote-unquote, and the video, and they raised several important questions and say several incorrect things about me personally that I'd like to correct, and that's what I'm going to do in this video. Overall, I guess this video is probably going to be an hour long because first we're going to have to listen to everything they say, and then I'm going to respond to each point that he makes and provide the proof that he says I don't provide in my video, which I do provide in the video. Directly below the video is a full description with all the links backing up everything I'm talking about, the science, Michio Kaku talking about it on ABC News, Weather Channel covering it, U.S. Navy, CNN, We've got the History Channel. We've got multiple documentaries on the subject. I've got peer-reviewed scientific papers, experiments done in the laboratory, all provided down below the video. Now, he says there's no information provided on past storms either. And I fully provided Sandy, Frankenstorm, Lekema, Crosa, recent typhoons. I didn't just appear on the scene here covering this current Haiyan typhoon. The reason I was even watching background microwave imagery to begin with is because of the previous storms that happened. I put out videos going back through October. We watched storm after storm form out of these pulses and then follow up earthquakes, which we'll take issue with in, the, in this later on in the video. We're going to respond to each point that this hit piece generates. Now they start off by calling me a conspiracy theorist. I'd like to point out that my logo is a blown up pyramid. I do not believe in conspiracies. I believe in either truth or lie. And we prove one or the other. We go where it leads us. Sometimes conspiracies are true. Sometimes conspiracies are false. There's so many false conspiracies that we spend half our time debunking here online. And that leads me to the person who asked this question to begin with, who's a fellow truther that I call. And it's Montegraff. Of all people, Montegraff raised the question first. That's why I made the video to begin with. He asked, is this possible? Was the typhoon created? This led me to go look and see. I'd been watching previously, and of course, there it is. Forming at the same time that the typhoon starts, the microwave pulse happens and the rotation begins. If that was just one time, I'd say okay. But below the video, I've provided proof. Seven previous storms. Seven all the previous typhoons that have just recently struck, Crosa, Francisco, Wipfa, Lekema, those storms came out of microwave pulses. We've documented it. It's undeniable. Everything I'm getting ready to show to you in this video is backed up by peer review. We can go and look at the American Meteorological Society conferences, the U.S. Navy lab experiments. The laboratory experiments shown on the Weather Channel, microwaves producing rotation, vortex rotation, creating tornadoes in, in the video is what they're talking about. This is so well documented, I'm going to take you through it and prove it point by point. First, you have to hear what they say, okay? So we're going to play their whole video first. It's 13 minutes long. It's a lot of propaganda about me personally that's not true. They say they don't know who I am. 
They say they don't know who I am and that I'm anonymous. No, I'm not anonymous. I'm right out here. You can just search me. I've got a description of who I am on my website. You guys can look me up. There's a lot of uh, BS that comes up, you know, hit pieces that people have written. But just go through that. Go find my description. You can ask somebody. You can ask my 5,000 friends on my personal page. Or you can come over to my public page where I have my picture posted. And you can go down through and read my descriptions. Now, I've issued my response officially in text to the scientist already here on my page. Okay? And this should answer some questions to Monty, who asked, Montograph here, who asked the question to begin with. I hope this answers everything, Monty, all the links that I provided. And when I say I provided links, look, I provided links. And we're not talking my own research, we're talking backed up, peer reviewed papers, documented laboratory experiments, etc. It's almost like the scientist just overlooked all that. He even said that earthquakes aren't related to frequency. Now, we're going to go through that later. First, like I said, let's listen to their response. Okay, guys? Much love. Thanks for hanging in there. And this video, like I said, is going to be pretty long. Cheers. Conspiracy theorists are at it again. Netizens have mixed reactions on a YouTube video which claims that Typhoon Yolanda was man-made. The speaker in the video who introduced himself as Dutch Sins said microwave pulses from radar installations triggered the typhoon. Here are excerpts from that video. A lot of people are asking me if I think that this current storm that's hitting the Philippines is man-made or being controlled. And I'm going to have to respond with a confident yes. Again, a confident yes that these storms are being man-made and possibly fully controlled on their paths to where their final destinations are. Here is the current storm, for instance, the strongest storm to ever form, according to several mainstream media outlets, the strongest storm to ever form just hit the Philippines with 195 mile an hour sustained winds and 235 mile per hour gusts. Now they call it over there Yolanda, the name of the storm, and we are calling it Haiyan. I think that's the designation from NOAA. So here's the storm that's currently hitting, and uh, you can see it's just barreling across there. Well, we can follow this back, okay? You can follow this storm's formation back over here, okay? And what we've seen several times is out here near Guam, of all places, we see a large microwave spiral-shaped pulse that comes from the north and then extends to the south over Guam. Following that, we see rotation begin to develop and form into these cyclones. And it's happened time after time now. It's happened like four times. All right, that is the excerpt of the video. Now, reacting to that video, Project NOAA Executive Director Dr. Mahar Lagmai tweets the statements were, quote, incredible and illogical. He now joins us on the line to tell us more. Good afternoon, Dr. Lagmai. Hi, PJ. Good afternoon. Well, obviously, you've seen the video yourself. Um, as Carmine and I were talking about it earlier, to many who are not as educated in your field may believe it. Um, but is this true? Is there a possibility that a microwave pulse from any ultramagnetic, you know, uh, uh, machine or or satellite can trigger anything like that to disturb the weather? Well, I think uh, those claims that he was giving before he could relate the uh, microwave to the to the cyclone or to the typhoon that uh, hit the Philippines, he must first demonstra uh, demonstrate that the microwave was the one who formed it. Mm -hmm. uh, from the images that he was showing, it would appear that the the uh, typhoon was already developed when he was showing the microwave pulses that were being transmitted. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing that I noticed was that he was also relating the microwave pulses with the occurrence of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we know about earthquakes is that they form because of the uh, accumulation of energy due to earth movement and through time the, this energy is accumulated along faults, mm -hmm. and it does not at all relate 
to any type of microwave that he was referring to. And uh, in that sense, I would think that uh, that person who keeps on uh, stating or uh, mentioning the word Stanford to boost his credibility, I think is just pulling a, you know, a trick on us. Okay. But the video that he's using, though, um, when he backtracks the Jay, formation... Can you, can you uh, speak up, please? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Professor Dr. Legmai, the video that he was using uh, with the different colors, uh, he backtracked the formation of the storm. That is legitimate. That he did not fabricate, in your thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I could not hear you well. Okay, we'll try to up the volume a bit. Um, going back to the video, the video that he used to show the, the formation of the storm, that was actual video of it, what had happened in the past week. He did not fabricate that portion of the video. I think he was getting it from uh, the normal um, uh, websites of okay. uh, some government agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was trying to relate all of these uh, cloud formations mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, the, the microwave pulses that he was seeing. Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to uh, demonstrate that uh, such uh, curves that would appear would uh, come up or correspond to these transmitted pulses. Mm -hmm. First, but he, he must demonstrate that well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a scientist, there's a long and rigorous process to demonstrate that microwave is related to the formation of all of these curves that he was showing mm -hmm. and to the formation of uh, clouds. Uh, and uh, it's not just possible to come up with a Google uh, image or mm -hmm. video of uh, what he was demonstrating which is hard to test and hard to, to uh, you know, to examine mm -hmm. and come up with uh, incredible, incredulous statements about uh, the relationship of these microwave pulses. Mm -hmm. It's not just not, it's just not possible in science. So as a scientist, I, I, I would prefer to first see the evidence. He must demonstrate it. It's an hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody is entitled to make an hypothesis. But he must be able to demonstrate it well, clearly, and it must be repeatable. Right. As of the moment, there is no reason to believe this person. Okay. He also, uh, towards the end of his video, was sharing about his thoughts on weather warfare. I mean, and obviously, it shows that he is one person who seemed to have believed in this conspiracy theory that uh, some superpowers in this world have felt that they've discovered ways to manipulate weather. Uh, your thoughts on this kind of, you know, conspiracy theory is that that technology even exists? The closest that I know where I've heard discussions about it is uh, climate engineering. Mm -hmm. There are research projects that want to test whether it is possible to inject aerosols and sulfur into the atmosphere. Uh, it, it's a project that uh, was shut down by uh, government because of public uh, complaints. Uh, this project intends to inject uh, SO2 and sulfate into the atmosphere, and depending on where it is injected, it will cool down the earth, and they say that it's possible that the amount and the location where you put it could control uh, the climate in any particular region. Mm -hmm. So that's the closest that I know, and uh, this one, the microwave uh, uh, theory, or the conspiracy theory, has yet to be proven well. Um, but what is, is, there, is there such a thing as a microwave pulse? Does this terminology exist? Hello? Yeah, doc, uh, Professor, can you see the yes. hearing? Yeah, what is a microwave pulse? Does this actually exist? Does this actually a microwave pulse? Does it exist? Yes, yes. Is it real that there is such a thing as a microwave pulse? Uh, whether yes, or not it can affect uh, well, whether well, or not. It's uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see it uh, uh, as a visible light. Okay. The colors, uh, I mean the colors that we see, that, that's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. The, the shorter uh, wavelengths or the higher frequencies are along the, the, the wavelengths that generate the X-rays, the gamma rays, and then in the longer wavelengths, we have microwaves. And uh, those uh, 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 waves are, are quite uh, long wavelengths, and they are used for transmission, of, uh, for communication, and also for radar transmission. All right. So um, it, there's it, a it can be used for, for good purposes. Okay. And uh, 
I see no relation as of the moment yet. Uh, there's no uh, very solid demonstration of its relation with with how it can uh, generate cyclones, mm -hmm. how it can make uh, the water evaporate, accumulate in a particular area, and it's just not simply well well documented in his uh, Google video. All right. Um, there was a portion in the video who is showing that around that area near Guam, the, most of it is orange, and then for a brief moment it flickers into yellow, and that's what he's trying to describe as that was the pulse, and that's what made this storm, you know, uh, go bigger or finally form into a storm that is supposed to form. Um, what could have caused that discoloration? If if uh, he's saying it was like there are many coincidences uh, okay. that we find in nature. Ah, so okay. there was one that uh, he presented, mm -hmm. and he just made this uh, uh, what do you call this? This uh, click uh, that corresponds to the microwave. Okay. Anybody can do that. Right. Uh, you 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 don't uh, prove something through your your golden voice or the way you 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 uh, speak it out mm -hmm. or uh, present it. And uh, what he was doing was he was trying to name drop the uh, Stanford University okay, right. to uh, mm -hmm. to boost his argument. But he's not even uh, using his real name to begin with. <laughs> All right, uh, okay. he's not even using his real name to begin with to identify himself. <clears throat> Did he identify himself? I don't think so. From what I heard, I, don't, I haven't read through his blog, though. We'll yeah. see. But well, um, <laughs> Let's just put it this way. In science, you have to demonstrate it. Right. It, has, it must be repeatable, mm -hmm. and it must be testable. Mm -hmm. He was not able to do mm -hmm. that, and uh, therefore, it's not proven, mm -hmm. and it's not to be, be believe, believed. All right. Um, beyond this one, um, there was another thing that I, I heard the other day, but I didn't read it myself. People are telling me it's online. That there's another conspiracy theory that this this defied the laws of physics because of the the size and the the, the strength of it. Um, is this as well plausible that the the, the sheer size of it, of of Yolanda or Hayan defied the current laws of physics, or is this climate change? Um, well. The, the foreign meteorologists say that this is the most powerful typhoon mm -hmm. ever to make landfall in recorded history. Okay. But uh, when we look at the database of old typhoons, there are others, uh, those that did not make landfall, ah, that are bigger, that are bigger ah, than okay. Typhoon Yolanda. Okay, all right. So it's not necessarily off the charts in terms of, in terms of being the largest. It's just the largest to make landfall. Yes. All right. Well, um, thank you, uh, Professor, for sharing uh, your insights on this video. It is causing a lot of confusion to viewers and, and our audience as well as they keep tweeting us uh, this video and asking us questions about it. But at least uh, we will put this video, this interview online as well, so they can have a perspective from a well-known scientist as well. My, Dr. my final note is that yes, sir. if it's not proven, it's just simply arm-waving. It's just an hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Anybody is entitled to do that, but they need to prove it in order to be scientific in order to be considered as something as uh, really happening. All right, very well said. Thank you so much for joining Thank us, Project you. NOAA Executive Director, Dr. Mahar Lagmai. Thank you. Okay, well, you just heard their whole video. Now let's get into the response. They make several personal claims, ad hominem attacks, I would call them, referring to me as conspiracy theorists. We'll just go ahead and disregard those. And they also say something about me being illogical and incredible or at least the claims that I'm making are illogical and incredible. I take umbrage to that. This is a topic that is well reviewed. Experiments have been done. Professionals have come out and told us, and I intend to show you that evidence from their mouths, not mine, showing you that this is indeed a reality that began a while ago and carries on through today. Now, we can get into this. Uh, let's just start by, uh, is there a possibility that this could happen? That's what they ask. And his response is kind of priceless. He says that the storm already formed. Well, in the video, which I show, and it's linked down below, you can go watch the original. You can see the date and time stamp for when the pulse occurred and when the storm formed. You can compare them and the rotation began after the pulse occurred. You can see it in the video, you can see it in the feed. All the links that I have provided, every single link that I provided is either through a government agency or an EDU. 
Now, I know people are international. You don't know what that means, but I have no access. I can't change any of this information. None of it is false. It's all there for public review. Everything I'm showing you, every PDF is linked and sourced. I have not put up anything that is not linked and sourced. I've been doing this for three years now, documenting these things. I've documented the last five storms in Asia coming from microwave pulses, Typhoon Haiyan being one of them. Let's also go into Francisco. Let's also go into Wipfa, Lekema, and we will. I've got them all linked down below, and you guys can review this for yourself. It's going to take you a long time to go through it. It's going to take me an hour to make this video. It's going to take you a month to go read everything or more. So their claim is that the storm already formed. That's false. It's not true. You can go compare the date and time stamps and see when the storm was designated, and it came after the pulse. Uh, and I believe that was October 31st into November 1st, and that's when the pulse occurred. The storm designation came after that. Secondly, he takes critique with the earthquake connection not being related to high frequency. That video, Project NOAA Executive Director Dr. Mahar Lagmai tweets, the statements were, quote, incredible and illogical. He now joins us on the line to tell us more. Good afternoon, Dr. Lagmai. Hi, PJ. Good afternoon. Well, obviously, you've seen the video yourself. Um, as Carmine and I were talking about it earlier, to many who are not as educated in your field may believe it. Um, but is this true? Is there a possibility that a microwave pulse from any ultramagnetic you know, uh, uh, machine or, or satellite can trigger anything like that to disturb the weather? Well, I think uh, those claims that he was giving before he could relate the uh, microwave to the, to the cyclone or to the typhoon that uh, hit the Philippines, he must first demonstra uh, demonstrate that the microwave was the one who formed it. Mm -hmm. uh, from the images that he was showing, it would appear that the, the uh, typhoon was already developed when he was showing the microwave pulses that were being transmitted. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing that I noticed was that he was also relating the microwave pulses with the occurrence of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we know about earthquakes is that they form because of the uh, accumulation of energy due to earth movement and through time the this energy is accumulated along fault mm -hmm. and it does not at all relate to any type of microwave that he was referring to and uh, in that sense i would think that uh, that person who keeps on uh, stating or uh, mentioning the word stanford to boost his credibility I think it's just pulling a, you know, a trick on us. Okay. And that's blatantly incorrect. And in my response, I will put a link down below so that the good scientist, the good doctor, can go read up on what's called efficiency scaling. And it's in my whole post here on electromagnetic spectrum, which you guys can come check, covering HARP, radar, high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, very high frequency, the difference between them and what their effects are. And they're being turned into weapons. The doctor might not know this, that when a high frequency is emitted from a, a transmitter, it goes up into the Earth's atmosphere and ionosphere. It then modulates, cross-modulates naturally, the Earth does it, into a low frequency. That's how they're able to generate low frequency using a place like HARP, let's say, or even from a radar. And so it is my contention when a high frequency is generated that indeed the resonance takes place, that the wave spreads out over a distance, forms into a low frequency, just like they tell us efficiency scaling does, and there's your low frequency generated from high frequency. It's how they're able to generate ELF, extremely low frequency, using HARP, the high frequency active aurora research program. And this is all documented. You guys can go look this up yourselves. Now, he then brings up Stanford. Of all things, he had to bring up Stanford and saying that I'm name dropping Stanford in my video. Well, I encourage you guys to come over and check this video that he's talking about. And I'm showing in the video Climate Viewer, which is Google Earth. And it's overlaid with all the electromagnetic stations that we're, we know of. And you can look at them and see where they are on the planet Earth. 
And I'm showing that in the video, and Stanford VLF is a program that the U.S. government sponsors, and it's through EDU, a college here in the United States, Stanford, and they run a whole program where they bounce VLF signals using high frequency from HARP. Here we go, Stanford Star Labs HARP website. I mean, I'm just showing you guys what they have done. Here's the Wayback Machine. It goes back into the 90s. Here we are back in the year 2000. They're, they have a website up explaining how they operate, how they generate VLF using high frequency. Now we know very low frequency is used for something called earth penetrating tomography. Now we're going to get very technical here. Earth penetrating tomography is a way to look into the earth using waves, radio waves. And just like a bass speaker in a car will travel through the bass sound will travel through the car and you'll hear it inside of your house the same phenomenon happens on an even lower frequency you can penetrate the earth's crust and see oil deposits underground bases tunnels those sorts of things and this is all stuff that's documented here on my website i've spent three years putting this information together with dozens of other researchers we have page one and page two Page two is even longer than page one. We can go through each description. You can see the earthquake connection. And just in case you don't believe me, I'm gonna go ahead and play a video now where you can hear it from a doctor who specializes in the subject who was on the History Channel, okay? So we'll watch this video next where Dr. Brooks Agnew explains how to make an earthquake and then we'll get back into the rest of the response. Oh, one final thing before we get into this. Their other claim at the start of the video, they're asking, did he fabricate this? Did he fabricate this? All the links are from .gov institutional websites, guys. And they were all originally provided. Dr. Agnew experienced the power of ELF waves firsthand back in the 1980s. He was hired by an energy company to locate oil and gas using the same kind of ELF waves at much lower frequencies to carry out his search. It's a process called Earth tomography. But during one particular incident, Dr. Agnew believes his use of harp-like ELF waves accidentally triggered an earthquake. It was in the spring of 1987 we, we arrived in Roseburg, Oregon to use our ELF technology to search for oil and gas. Setting up that day, we had a little bit different results than we expected because the instant that we energized it, there was between a 4 and 4.5 on the Richter scale earthquake that occurred. We were so amazed about what seemed to be cause and effect. We get to an area that has a high propensity for earthquakes in an area known as the megathrust of the Pacific Northwest. We turn it on and an earthquake occurs. Dr. Agnew demonstrates how he may have triggered the quake. This is a scale model of what the area looked like in Oregon when we scanned for oil and gas in 1987. The strata right here represents the megathrust area underneath the ground. The rock represents a potential energy set up in the ground from a tectonic stress. What we're going to do is introduce ELF waves and demonstrate that it can in fact trigger an earthquake. In this case, Dr. Agnew is using a stereo speaker to produce the ELF waves needed for his demonstration. ELF waves, extremely low frequency waves, are just like a subwoofer. In your car, you can, you can actually feel the vibrations through your body. ELF waves are the same way. They vibrate the earth, and at right resonant frequencies, they can have devastating effects. When the speaker is activated, ELF waves begin to emit. Tiny vibrations in the sand are detected. Then a few seconds later, the rock representing a fault line shifts. As you can see, in a very few seconds, the resonant frequency built up in our model released the potential energy in the rock. That concussion, on a real scale, would have been felt for 100 miles. These conditions are already set up in the ground. All it takes is the activation energy to make the release happen. This is a small scale, and we're only using 30 watts in this scale. When HARP's broadcast array in Gakona, Alaska sends pulses of ELF waves into the ionosphere, the waves get reflected back down and pass through the earth and ocean. 
If 3.6 million watts of ELF waves were purposely or accidentally aimed at an already unstable fault line, it could, according to Dr. Agnew, cause a tremendous earthquake. You know, looking at just simple instabilities, you know, what does it take to create an avalanche? A guy walking across an unstable ice field. What does it take to trigger an earthquake? The right signal coming in when the pressures are already built up and they're at their threshold, that feather, and in our case, that hammer, releases that energy. And uh, in that sense, I would think that uh, that person who keeps on uh, stating or uh, mentioning the word Stanford to boost his credibility, I think is just pulling a, you know, a trick on us. Okay. Okay. So now we're getting a little bit more frisky here. Let's get into some of these claims, and he's starting to take a little bit more of a aggressive tone towards me there at the end. But uh, let's let's get into this. He says it must be demonstrated well. And then they ask, is microwave related to cloud forming? Which he says, no, it is not scientifically possible. And he asked to see the evidence, and he said it has to be demonstrated over and over again. Well, since people don't click the links down below the videos and don't bother to check the posts that have been made over the last two years and uh, refuse to listen to me personally, I'm going to go ahead and include the next round of videos where you can hear it from the talking heads on TV where they fully explain how frequency can induce CCN, which is cloud condensation nuclei, the precursor to rain. And what you're going to hear Dr. Michio Kaku explain to you in a second is summed up as such that frequency strips electrons from the atmosphere, which then act like dust particles, like nature would build a raindrop, but instead of a dust particle, it's actual base charge in the atmosphere that attracts molecules to form chains upon themselves. It's amazing, and he explains it, and he talks about the potential uses for the weather modification as sporting events and weddings. Okay, so you have to watch this video and hear it from him because people aren't hearing it from me. They refuse to hear it from me. They call me a conspiracy theorist. Is Michio Kaku a conspiracy theorist? I don't think so. I mean, what is it gonna take? Bill Nye the science guy to come out next? Really, here's Michio Kaku explaining it and the current US military operations that are doing it. We're gonna also get into the scientific experiments that have been done that prove microwaves induce rotation. Here's the weather channel. We're going to prove that the U.S. Navy already did it at the start of this year in the atmosphere using HARP. Massive superheated areas. We're going to prove that radar can do it through places like spear, transmission of electricity, heating at a distance. Once all that's proved, I think that's going to pretty much settle the debate. And the doctor and other professionals are going to have to do some reading. They're behind the times, clearly clearly behind the times or playing a cover-up game those are the only two options either he doesn't know or he's obfuscating the facts those are the only two logical options and i take again umbrage with being called illogical i'm from missouri in the states most people don't know we have a state motto for each state our state motto here in missouri which we all take very seriously i'm not kidding here show me show me means we won't believe it until you show us. We're the Doubting Thomases of the world. I'm the supreme skeptic. My logo is an anti-Illuminati logo, which means conspiracy buster. I do not believe in conspiracies, and I will get to the bottom of anything that you give me. Hear it from Michio Kaku. We'll get back into this in a second. ...are looking at how to change the weather on purpose. That's right. Lasers now could one day manipulate rain and lightning. CBS This Morning contributor Michio Kaku is a physics professor at City College of New York. Professor, nice to see you. Extraordinary seeing Al Gore and Bill Clinton there together with Charlie, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, they did not get into this discussion, no. though. <laughs> but it is fascinating. I mean, lasers, really, to change the weather? That's right. Well, as Mark Twain once famously said, everyone complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Well, instead of doing a rain dance, we physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. This is potentially a game changer. But this is experimental. It's experimental. However, in the laboratory so far, it works. 
When you have water vapor and you have dust particles or ice crystals, you can precipitate rain. It condenses around the seeds. These seeds can also be created by laser beams. By firing trillion watt lasers, you rip apart the electrons, creating what are called ions, and these ions act like seeds, like dust particles, bringing down rain and even lightning. Any, go ahead. Well, I, I, this is fascinates me in part because, too, I remember reading the stories that China had used this during the Olympics, that the USSR had used this after Chernobyl to create rain clouds. I mean, w did those really work then? We have some of these capabilities now? Inconclusive. Even in the 60s, the CIA used this to uh, bring down monsoons during the Vietnam War to wash out the Viet Cong. Governments have been playing with, with this to. thing. Alleged to. Alleged to, right. Yeah. Now, we realize that for decades now, these governments have been alleged to have experimented with weather control, but nothing conclusive. This time we're bringing in the laws of physics rather than simply uh, waving our hands and uttering mumbo jumbo. <laughs> We're actually using trillion watt lasers yeah. now. And in the laboratory, sure enough, they precipitate rain out of water vapor. Sure enough, you can actually bring down electricity yeah. down, the, down the beam. So what does it mean for drought areas that, that need to have rain for crops? And if they don't have them, uh, there's in the consequences of famine. Well, the bad news is if it's a clear blue sky, it's not going to do anything at all because it only takes water vapor that's already in the air and condenses it. However, for floods, for agriculture, for farmers, for people planning wedding parties, uh, football <laughs> games, you name it, outdoor events and agriculture and flooding and even hurricanes, all of them could be subject to weather modification. Incredibly mm. interesting. Professor Micho Kaku, thank you so much. Okay. Well, you just heard it from Dr. Michio Kaku, and uh, that pretty much settles whether or not it can be done using frequency, he brings up high frequency, trillion watt lasers, and the experiments are already being done at much less wattage, 750,000 watts, let's say, just one example of many. But now we're going to have to go listen to the doctor and their next portion of their response. And in this next portion, he brings up something which I urge you guys to read right here before you hear what he has to say, hear what Secretary of Defense William Cohen said in 1997, and here's the transcript, in case you don't believe me, from defense.gov. But let's go hear it from the doctor. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's hear his next question, quote unquote. But the video that he's using, though, um, when he backtracks the formation. Can you, can you uh, speak up, please? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Professor, Dr. Legmai, the video that he was using uh, with the different colors, uh, he backtracked the formation of the storm. That is legitimate. That he did not fabricate, in your thoughts. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I could not hear you well. Okay, we'll try to up the volume a bit. Um, going back to the video, the video that he used to show the, the formation of the storm, that was actual video of it, what had happened in the past week. He did not fabricate that portion of the video? I think he was getting it from uh, the normal um, uh, websites of okay. uh, some government agencies. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he was trying to relate all of these uh, cloud formations mm. uh, to, to uh, the, the microwave pulses that he was seeing. Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to uh, demonstrate that uh, such uh, curves that would appear would uh, come up or correspond to these transmitted pulses. Mm -hmm. But he, he must demonstrate that well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a scientist, there's a long and rigorous process to demonstrate that microwave is related to the formation of all of these curves that he was showing mm -hmm. and to the formation of uh, clouds. Uh, and uh, it's not just possible to come up with a Google uh, image or mm -hmm. video of uh, what he was demonstrating, which is hard to test and hard to to uh, you know to examine mm -hmm. and come up with the incredible, incredulous statements about uh, the relationship of these microwave pulses. Mm -hmm. It's not just not it's just not possible in science. So as a scientist, I, I, I would prefer to first see the evidence. He must demonstrate it. It's an hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody is entitled to make an hypothesis, but he must be able to demonstrate it well, clearly, and it must be repeatable. Right. As of the moment, there is no reason to believe this person. Okay. He also, uh, towards the end of his video, was sharing about his thoughts on 
weather warfare. I mean, it obviously, it shows that he is one person who seemed to have believed in this conspiracy theory that uh, some superpowers in this world have felt that they've discovered ways to manipulate weather. Uh, your thoughts on this kind of, you know, conspiracy theory is that that technology even exists? The closest that I know where I've heard discussions about it is uh, climate engineering. Mm -hmm. There are research projects that want to test whether it is possible to inject aerosols and sulfur into the atmosphere. Uh, it, it's a project that uh, was shut down by uh, government because of public uh, complaints. Uh, this project intends to inject uh, SO2 and sulfate into the atmosphere, and depending on where it is injected, it will cool down the earth, and they say that it is possible that the amount and the location where you put it could control uh, the climate in any particular region. Mm -hmm. So that's the closest that I know, and uh, this one, the microwave uh, uh, theory, or the conspiracy theory, has yet to be proven well. Okay, well, here we go with the conspiracy talk again. And I do really take issue with that because I feel that the facts that are provided and the data that's been provided so far proves the facts completely. This is experiments have already been done, papers have already been written, and new technology is being developed to deal with these things. It's not a conspiracy. This comes from the Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, in 97. Others are engaging even in an eco-type of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. The United States is putting a whole bunch of money into it. We've built huge facilities and we are not the only ones. Let's not lay this at the feet of the United States completely. We've got China, we've got Russia, we've got several other countries involved and we've documented that over and over again. Is it a conspiracy theory? No. Dr. Michio Kaku just confirmed it. Here it is, all the way back in 1985. He brings up geoengineering aerosols, and he lies and says that the aerosol programs are no longer in place and that they don't spray anymore. Those government programs were discontinued, he said. This is the doctor that you just heard, and that's a blatant lie. We've got the 2012 and 2013 current cloud city in operations, and it's not for SO2 solar radiation management of sulfides. We're talking the spraying of silver iodide for precipitation enhancement. This is undeniable proof. These are companies that do it here in the States. Internationally, you guys are going to have to document this stuff in your countries. I can't do it all. I'm just doing it for here in the States to prove overall it's happening. Here's the NOAA weather modification form that has to be filled out. These are all .gov links. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go check each one of these links out. The current 2012 and 2013 cloud seeding operation schedules and lists we've already provided. Idaho Power, we have companies here in the States that spray to enhance the snow in the mountains so they can harvest that water to produce more energy in their hydroelectric plants. Colorado just passed some new laws regarding weather modification because they're spraying so much. Spraying silver iodide for precipitation enhancement, not SO2 for solar radiation management. There's been bills passed here in the United States to outlaw these things because they're trying to turn them into weapons. This is H.R. 2977. This is not conspiracy. They refer to even chemtrails in here. Weather mitigation bill to try and stop storms. There's multiple facilities built around the world that work in conjunction with each other, which I showed you in the first video. That's why I mentioned Stanford VLF to begin with. Stanford's taking part. VLF is just one portion of this whole frequency spectrum that they are manipulating and using to their ends, to certain means, to try and get things done. Okay? And we're talking from communication to weapon capability, anywhere in between. Now, in, in there, he says that, again, the government sh programs were shut down. I just showed you. Here's 2012-2013 current operations. And then he finishes it off with microwave conspiracies are not proved that HPM, high-powered microwaves, cannot induce weather phenomenon? Well, we have documented over 150 different cases of high-frequency pulses having a weather effect. If you don't accept those, you can come read the different papers presented, again, by the different agencies that prove that ionization 
Again, the stripping of electrons out of the atmosphere using frequency produces CCN, which is the formation of cloud. They made it rain in the desert 50 times in Saudi Arabia. We have resonance technology being demonstrated to the US government. Here's a company called Acquiesce. And I'll read this to you. I have a screenshot. This is from their PDF that they uh, work with the US government. And it says, over the past 10 years, the company Acquiesce has repeatedly demonstrated this technology to government and humanitarian observer groups. The proprietary weather modification system operates by utilizing resonance, and we're talking radio frequency, signals to divert oceanic atmospheric rivers into areas experiencing severe drought. The Acquiesce system does not rely on chemical or biologically hazardous materials, spraying of substances, which could potentially harm the environment. This is just one company of many that's doing it here in the States. The technology is proved. And that brings us in to the next video. Okay, so we're going to play this next video. It's from the Weather Channel, and they aired this just this past year, proving that microwaves can induce rotation. And we're talking about producing tornadoes. And they recreated the experiment in the laboratory. And it's a guy by the name of Dr. Slobodan Tepic, a dual MIT doctorate, that figured out that rotation can be developed using high frequency microwaves. And he recreates the experiment in the laboratory using a small laser to simulate a high powered microwave over a large distance. So outside, you would use a high powered microwave. Inside the laboratory, you use a small little laser to heat the plate, and it simulates the outside. And it was success. They covered this on the Weather Channel completely, which let's go watch that next. After that, we'll get into the next portion of what the doctor said. So far, what is that? We proved him wrong twice now. First, he said that it was a conspiracy theory and it didn't exist. Well, here's the US government fully talking about it. Then he said it was impossible to do. Michio Kaku and the experimenters here uh, prove him wrong. So let's go watch the experiment. Let's hear what the Weather Channel has to say on the subject. Oh my God. Oh my God. The whole house came apart. Pound for pound, tornadoes are the strongest weather force on Earth. With winds so powerful, they can toss trucks like trash. The rate of energy in just a typical tornado is several times the atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki. So what would it take to snuff one out? Oh my God, I hope they're okay. You're looking at a tornado that's forming, strengthening, and then eventually dissipating. Cold air is the enemy to tornadoes. And we kill these tornadoes before they kill us. Or better yet, could we turn a twister's tremendous energy into a force for good? I'm John Rennie, and I'm a science writer on the hunt for new ways to level the planetary playing field. We've come a long way since the last ice age, but there's still one force we haven't mastered, and that's Mother Nature. Can we figure out how to hack the planet to save ourselves from natural disasters? And even if we can, does that mean we should? With the power levels involved, it would be awesome if we could harness that energy. I mean, with like a windmill, it seems like you'd get a lot of, you'd get that windmill going pretty fast. I don't think that's such a good idea, Brian. I remember reading that windmills have kind of a fail-safe worked into them, and they won't really go at more than 40 miles per hour. Also, I wouldn't want one to break off in the middle of a tornado and become some sort of horrible projectile. I actually read about this guy in Switzerland who plans to kind of make his own tornado and then harness the energy from it. Build a tornado? I'm not completely sure how it works, but it looks like he wants to try and trigger the formation of a vortex by shooting a bunch of microwave beams at the sky. A vortex. I like it. As hacks of the Earth go, that one sounds just crazy enough to work. After the break, I'll meet the man who believes the solution to our energy needs lies not in solar, nuclear, or wind turbines, but in highly controlled, man-made tornadoes. My quest to hack a tornado for power has led me to one of the most energy-conscious countries in the world, Switzerland. I'm going to track down the engineer, Slobodan Tepic. He has an idea for creating an artificial tornado that could be used to tap into a virtually bottomless supply of energy. My hope is that we can provide 
clean energy for about a half million people. Wow. His idea would work like this. A high-powered microwave beam anchored in the base of this shell-like wind guide would create the warm updraft needed to trigger a vortex. The walls in the wind guide funnel the fast-moving winds through 64 high-performance turbines that harness the energy and distribute it into the grid like a typical power plant. To demonstrate how microwaves could be used to create a tornado-generating updraft, Slobodan turned to his laser-equipped water tank. The beam comes through the center and actually monitor the vortex being generated. On this small scale, the heat transfer can't be seen with the naked eye. But if the upper plate, which represents the upper atmosphere, shows an increase in temperature, then there's hope for a microwave-induced tornado on a larger scale. And in just a few minutes, we can already start to see results. So this 0.3 reading that I'm seeing here at the top plate reflects the upper plate is being worn by the laser beam. Successfully heating the upper plate with the laser beam offers hope that someday we might be able to induce a tornado-like column of wind and harness its energy. But if it could be done, how big would a life-size tornado power plant have to be to meet the energy needs of half a million people? I guess somewhere on the order of 600 meters in diameter. So 600 meters, that's like more than a third of a mile across that. About that, mm -hmm. right. It's going to be a while before we can hope to power a small city with artificial tornadoes, and maybe even longer before we can dismantle the naturally occurring ones that routinely blaze a path of destruction across the United States. But the science behind some of these fledgling ideas seems solid. So it's not out of the question that tornadoes might one day be hacked. Until we're a little further along, I don't think I'm going to be looking up the real estate listings in Tornado Alley anytime soon. <laughs> Remember, Tornado Alley is, is really just the hardest hit area here in the United States. Tornadoes can hit anywhere. I am from North Texas, in the middle of Tornado Alley, and I have had to hide from my fair share of tornadoes. But I was pretty surprised to hear that there was a tornado in Brooklyn. Oh, lots. Twisters hate hipsters, as you know. <laughs> Hacking tornadoes is no simple feat, but the dangers of these fierce, fast-moving storms can't be ignored. And with random outbreaks threatening woefully unprepared areas, like this Brooklyn neighborhood was in 2010, the sooner we can stop tornadoes in their tracks, the better. And even if tapping tornadoes for their massive energy still eludes us, well, we'll keep hacking. Until then, get to safety. Okay, well, you just heard it from Dr. Slobodan Tepic and on the Weather Channel. That's now the third time. Three different sets of professionals that are explaining how it's done, the science behind it, and proving that it can be done in laboratory experiments. Which leads us to our next portion. We're going to have to go listen to them yet once again and hear what else they have to say. Now, this next portion, they do kind of dive into me a little bit personally. Just be prepared for that. And we'll be able to blaze through that pretty quick, at ad hominem attack. And we'll get into the science of what we're talking about here. But you've got to hear it straight from them. Um, but what is, is there, is there such a thing as a microwave pulse? Does this terminology exist? Hello? Yeah, doc, uh, professor, can you see the yes. hearing? Yeah, what is a microwave pulse? Does this actually exist? Does this actually a microwave pulse? Does it exist? Yes, yes. Is it real that there is such a thing as a microwave pulse? Uh, whether yes. or not it can affect uh, well, whether well, or not. It's uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see it uh, uh, as a visible light. Okay. In the colors, uh, I mean the colors that we see, that, that's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. The, the shorter uh, wavelengths or the higher frequencies, are along the, the, the wavelengths that generate the X-rays, the gamma rays, and then in the longer wavelengths, we have microwaves. And uh, those uh, 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 waves are, are quite uh, long wavelengths, and they are used for transmission, of, uh, for communication, and also for radar transmission. All right. So um, it, there it, it can be used for, for good purposes. Okay. And, uh, I see no relation as of the moment yet. Uh, there's no uh, very solid demonstration of its relation with, with how it can 
uh, generate cyclones, mm-hmm. how it can make uh, the water evaporate, accumulate in a particular area. And it's just not simply well well documented in his uh, Google video. All right. Um, there was a portion in the video who is showing that around that area near Guam, the most of it is orange. And then for a brief moment, it flickers into yellow. And that's what he's trying to describe as that was the pulse. And that's what made this storm you know, uh, go bigger or finally form into a storm that is supposed to form. Um, what could have caused that discoloration if, if uh, he's saying it was a microphone? There are many coincidences uh, okay. that we find in nature. Ah, so okay. there was one that uh, he presented mm-hmm. and he just made this, uh, uh, what do you call this, this uh, click uh, that corresponds to the microwave. Okay. Anybody can do that. Right. Uh, you 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 don't uh, prove something through your your golden voice or the way you 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 uh, speak it out mm-hmm. or uh, present it. And uh, what he was doing was he was trying to name drop the uh, Stanford University okay, right. to uh, right. to boost his argument. But he's not even using his real name to begin with. All right, okay. uh, prof- he's not even using his real name to begin with to identify himself. <clears throat> Did he identify himself? I don't think so. From, from what I heard, I don't. I haven't read through his blog, though. We'll see. But um. Wow, really? Golden voice, claiming I'm trying to name drop on Stanford. Really? That is getting to the point where we're talking ad hominem attack. We can just glaze over that by saying, I am not name dropping Stanford. Stanford is just one of many organizations that's taking part in high frequency and low frequency experiments. For instance, one we're looking at here, the one hop buoy experiment, where a buoy was placed off the coast of New Zealand to pick up the high frequency transmission from HARP in Alaska has what's called a conjugate point, a corresponding point on the Southern pole, magnetically speaking, where if they put out a high frequency pulse, it goes from Alaska up into the upper ionosphere and atmosphere, cross-modulates into ELF, VLF, very low frequency, and then when it gets down here back to the surface of the Earth on the South Pole, it cross-modulates naturally into high frequency again, and then the Earth bounces that back and forth in a band, so to speak, that they can pump full of electromagnetic frequency and they can put a a huge amount of electromagnetism into a magnetic band so to speak that goes from north to south pole and it bounces back and forth for up to three to four days when that happens there's a modulation effect that happens and a resonance now stanford is just like i said one of many we've got leicester university you've got uh, harvard you've got uh, alaska edu just several colleges, institutions involved with every project that's going on. Now, one other thing he brings up is, again, at the start of this, he says that high frequency can't lead to earthquakes. Well, there's physics studies on the propagation of earthquakes through ELF, through modulated high frequency heating. So we're talking about heating an area with plasma with high frequency, just like your microwave in your kitchen, only over a much larger area and much more powerful, much more focused, much more high tech in the way they target these microwave frequencies. Uh, The stations that I showed in the video, again, you guys should go watch the original video, which we'll get to in a second here, and the confirmed forecasts that have happened, the other events that led up to this. But first, but first I want you guys to watch a video that I put out back at the start of 2013. And this is something I would encourage the doctor to watch. And if you guys haven't seen it before, you need to watch it. Where the U.S. Navy did the experiments, this is proved. You can watch the video. We're going to play that now. Then we'll get into the prior examples. We'll start with the most current typhoon, Typhoon Haiyan. And then we'll go back through Francisco, Wipfa, Crosa, Lekema. These are all the most recent ones. If we have time, we can even jump into Sandy, Chantal, Irene, and this is here in the States last year, all influenced by high pulses, high frequency microwave pulses, between high frequency and microwave. There's no way to know. Now, one other thing that he says before we get into this, he says it's natural. That's the most crazy thing of all. He says it's natural. So we're going to prove, watching this 
U.S. Navy video that it can be done. Again, one more time, we're going to prove it can be done with the scientific experiments. Then we're going to get into the prior examples. I think that pretty much settles it. Then we'll go into the last portion of their little video here, which is just a pretty much a rip on me saying that not to believe anything that I put out. Okay, so let's get into it. Without further ado, here I am back at the start of 2013, announcing a discovery made through HARP in the U.S. Navy, generating plasma in the atmosphere. Cheers, folks. Hey, everybody. Dutch Sense here. 4.50 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday, February 27th, 2013. And I've got you over here on my website. I want to go ahead and give a big shout out to Tattooed1009 for letting me know about this yesterday. This is breaking news regarding HARP up in Alaska and a discovery, a release discovery that was made by the Naval Research Laboratories released two days ago now. So let me just go ahead and take you through this here really quick so you can understand the significance of what I'm getting ready to read you. Now, for the last two years, I've been under severe criticism from multiple critics about what I've called harp rings, and these are really radar pulses in the high-frequency band coming from ground-based stations. That's why I named them harp rings. But uh, radar pulse rings, harp rings, and I've got a huge, huge list of all the documented harp rings that I've documented and other people have, and I'll put a link down below to this so you guys can scroll through and see past examples of what we're talking about here. But for the longest time, people said it could not be done. Radio frequency could not be used to generate any kind of plasma in the atmosphere or in the ionosphere, and that it was solely for research purposes. Well, the U.S. Naval Labs have basically admitted, as of yesterday, that they were able to generate a multiple kilometer wide plasma bubble and sustain it for over an hour using 1.44 megahertz to 4.34 megahertz and they give the resonance, they give the frequency. Now this is important because NEXRAD radar, let me take you back over here, NEXRAD radar, my original observation was that high frequency pulses were being emitted from ground-based radars, which were having a weather effect, a heating effect around the area. And people said it couldn't be done. Well, it turns out NEXRAD pulses from zero to 12.4 megahertz, anywhere in between zero and 12.4 megahertz. Now we're talking here, zero, to 4.34 megahertz. So it falls within the spectrum, the pulse frequency. This is proved, here it is, the US Naval Research Labs have done it, and they did it using the billion watt facility up at HARP. Now, that's over a very large area that's generated very high up in the atmosphere. Now, what we're seeing here with radar, radar works at about 750,000 watts af after it goes through the klystron tubes, 750,000 peak watts. And so we're looking at smaller versions of the same facility. And they talk about it, the circular appearance of what appears here, and they even are able to image it on their radar, which is slightly different than the weather radar that we see standard civilian-wise. I urge you guys to come over and read this whole article. If you have previously thought that this was impossible, or if you're a skeptic that said it couldn't be done, you definitely need to read this and understand that they just announced a day ago that they did it using HARP in conjunction with observations through radar. So you can see HARP on radar. That's something else that I want to take you guys through really quick. I'm going to take you over to my other HARP post. This has been up since April, and I've added to it continuously with more information as it's become available. So we've got TV shows talking about it. We have different facility locations talking about it. Um, let me take you down to the bottom of the post here where I've added the most recent information. And the other discovery that we made a month ago now is that radar devices are used as quote unquote heaters and they're doing it over the North Pole for instance from a place called SPEAR, S-P-E-A-R and they're able to project a radar frequency here's a diagram from their site showing super darn radar at the peripherals then you've got your SPEAR radar at the center pointing up to a spot where they cause massive heating but we're talking upwards of five to eight thousand degrees they're able to generate from that, they also have found that radar itself, when it goes up and disturbs the ionosphere, gives its own resonant signal that appears in the shape of a circle. Okay, and they show it here. Here's a diagram here. 
So I urge you folks, please, if you're skeptical on this, go read through the information. You'll see we are not exaggerating this at all. The U.S. military is now acknowledging that they're able to do it using HARP. And we found, of course, documents that show radar is used in conjunction with HARP to do the same thing in the S and C band. Here's an example right here where they were able to do simulation lightning experiments with induced plasma using the MIT S band and C band UHF radars. Okay, so there's a, per a perfect document from 1994 showing all the way back in 94 they were doing it. Now, one final thing, if you scroll down through here, when you get down to the bottom of all these pictures, I've got hundreds of them, you'll see pictures going back to the late 90s, which we pulled from Thomas Bearden's old archived site, which no longer exists. It turns out Thomas Bearden, back in the late 90s, was documenting the same radar ring phenomenon, and no one knew about it because he had it backed up on his old site that no one could go on. Now that it's in archives, we're able to go through it, and actually save the images. And so just keep scrolling down, you'll see several images from the late 90s going into the early 2000s that show you time after time the same thing that we're experiencing now. And what we're seeing are basically frequency pulses that are causing plasma to be induced or ionization before plasma actually appears, an electrical static buildup that occurs, most likely because the ionization turns into cloud condensation nuclei. CCN. It may be unintentional what they're doing with the radar or originally was unintentional. And from that, they figured out that they could do it. And now it's done on a daily basis almost across the continental United States. And we've seen very severe weather, very, very strong storms develop from these things. Okay. So I hope that takes you through it, guys. Again, go read the article. I'll link it down below. All the information is down below. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comment field. And I want to give a big congratulations to all the people over the last two years who stuck with it, who didn't just believe the quote-unquote professionals who said it couldn't be done. The radar professionals over at Metabunk, for instance, or any one of these other skeptic sites that said a year ago this could not be done. Well, so much for the professionals and the talking heads. This is why you can't take their word for it. You have to look into it yourself. Okay, we saw something strange appearing on radar over many months, and they denied it and said it couldn't be done, and it was just background clutter, and they gave every explanation in the book for what they said it could be, except for the obvious, which is a pulse appearing over a city, which then a storm comes and hits that pulse within two to three days. It's undeniable. They accused me of photoshopping this stuff. They accused me of hoaxing this stuff, and it's not a hoax. It's not a photoshop. The rings really do appear, and storms really do go towards the center of the rings within two to three days. Okay? And I hope that answers some questions, guys. You'll really enjoy a lot of these pictures because they are very high detailed, and you can go and verify whether or not storms hit these areas within a certain amount of time. That's the other thing. All the date and time stamps are down below. You can see which ones were hits, which ones were misses, etc. Much love. Hang in there. Well, there you heard it, straight from me at the start of this year, showing, without a doubt, the United States Navy did the experiment in the atmosphere, proving that high-frequency microwave, if you will, radar, can produce a heating effect in plasma, which can border in the thousands of degrees temperature. It's already been done. The science is settled. Now it's just a matter of educating the quote-unquote professionals who are already out there in the field who don't have the time to do the research before they talk about something. And really, that's what this boils down to, guys. This video proves it. He has proved 100% wrong. I'm backing up everything that I've showed you so far, and now we're going to go look at the actual examples. What got me into all this? All the previous storms that I've documented, which i would listed over here on my Facebook page, link down below, and let's just get right into it. The first thing, the thing that got me going with this was the current typhoon, Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Yolanda. Now the doctor says it's natural, and he says that it formed, the, the rotation formed before the pulse. Well, the storm wasn't designated until here, October 30th, 1st, 2nd. Well, let's go back to October 30th. Here we are on the 26th, 27th, and 28th. Let me zoom this in so you can see. 
26th, up here at the top, 27th, 28th, and going into the 29th, there's our pulse. Wait for it here, it's gonna be out here. There you go. Starting on the 29th, and the rotation then kicks up right out of that, and they designated a storm one to two days later, and then it goes over the Philippines and causes the damage that it caused. This is Typhoon Crosa, right here, this darker area that's already spinning. It went up over the northern Philippines, in between Philippines and Taiwan, where the earthquake happened at the same time as it passed. And it was born out of a microwave pulse, the one that I showed you earlier, but let's go back and look. These are all in my examples. I can't believe that the doctor over in the Philippines missed this. So here's an example, Typhoon Crosa. This is a video that I put out. The date and timestamps are undeniable. And I'm showing again the doc dot gov links. Now, let me take the video forward here. Let me mute this so we don't hear it. And I show you clearly in the video, let me full screen this and turn it on HD for you so you can really see it. So there's no doubt. And there we go. And here we go. So you can clearly see a microwave pulse occurs right there. And that gives birth to the rotation that turns in to Crosa. It starts to rotate right after this next frame. And I put all the links down below so you can watch it going into the future. Again, wait for it. You'll see the spiral shape on this, which again I proved was shortwave or high frequency, I should say. There it goes. It's not some kind of natural anomaly. It comes from up here. It's a directional beam, very large. And that gave birth to Typhoon Crosa. The third time it happened was Typhoon Lekema. These are all recent examples. Typhoon Lekema, born out of the original pulse that I showed you at the start of this video. But let's go forward in the video here and you can see it. And again, let me full screen this, turn it on HD so there's no question. Okay, and here's where I start showing. And we'll go ahead and hit play. There it is. Wait for it, we'll let it play a couple times. There, zap, and it gave birth to Lekema. You can see the rotation start right after it begins. Wait for it. Two colliding air masses, hit, and then the rotate starts right in the middle. And that's my video. You guys can go watch this. That's example number three. And these are all recent. Now we can go down. You guys, we don't have time to go through Sandy and Frankenstorm. That's a whole hour video in itself. However, again, let me just take you over and show you the pulse that occurred into the center of the storm. Watch it. I showed you this earlier in the video. You can even see it back out. It's in there for many hours. Here's the radar pulse that happened again. Okay, here it is on a national view. Here it is zoomed in. You can see the intensity chart and the high decibels of Z. So it's a really loud blast of whatever. Uh, we don't know exactly what the frequency is on. We know it's most likely in the megahertz band because that's what Nexred pulses on. Normally operates in the gigahertz, but when it pulses, megahertz, okay? Now that's, of course, Sandy, Frankenstorm, the one that sacked the east coast of the United States. We've got Chantal. You guys can go check this out. Check out Irene. Okay, here's my video. Let me just go ahead and play it for you. August 26, 2011. Here I am showing the world. Okay, let me go ahead and play this for you so you guys can really see this. And this is from 2011 again, guys. There we go. That was going into the center of the storm. You see the storm still pulse after the microwave beam goes into it. And I made note of where it's coming from. It's coming from the direction of Arecibo. And it's undeniable, but that's what led us in to go look into these things. This is all the way back in 2011. It turns out most of these storms have had some kind of microwave interference happen with them, which then leads them in a certain direction. And the heating, I think, proves that they can do it, that it's possible of being done. If you guys don't believe me, after all the evidence that's been shown, then you're really focusing on the personality of trying to listen to a person as opposed to the information. 
And that kind of leads me to the close of this video. You guys can go listen to the rest of their video. They just then go into climate change and they start discussing climate change, this amorphous climate change, which we all know is bunk. And that the human induced activity that I believe is causing the most heating are the high frequency systems that we've put in place all around the world from cell phones to Wi-Fi to radar to the high frequency systems that we're seeing and we're talking about now are all having a massive cumulative effect upon the planet and the world. And then the targeted systems, which I showed in the video that got me the whole response to begin with, are cumulative. There's so many, and I show that in here. I wasn't name dropping Stanford. Stanford's the VLF. VLF isn't responsible for the high frequency pulse. No, it's a high frequency system that's responsible for the high frequency pulse. Stanford is just a name that was used in the video because we saw the VLF antennas in the video. They are not related. I said it in the video. They're not related, by the way, just in case there was any confusion. I'm going to put a link down below to all of my videos that I would refer to as must-sees in regard to weather modification. And we're talking cloud seeding. We're talking hurricane modification. We're talking tornado making. And we're talking even what we're talking now. I'm going to have to add this in as well. I want to thank you guys for sticking through the whole video and watching. And again, if you're curious, the links are down below. And this should settle any debate, quote unquote, that's being had because I have fully backed up my position. All right. Much love, folks. Be safe.